Good morning. My name is Thomas Hurst, and welcome to Kirkley's local TV's weekly wind-up. Each week we bring you up to date on all the latest news in the Kirkley's area. We aim to be interesting, amusing, challenging, and at times provocative. But we're not just satisfied with talking to you. We want you to talk to us, and if you, ha if you have any views regarding what's discussed here today, you can contact us by email on info at kirkleyslocaltv.com, and you can find us on Twitter by searching at Kirkley's Local TV. Now, on our panel this week, uh, local community activist uh, Mumtaz Ali, Chair of the Huddersfield Civic Association, Chris Marsden, and Conservative Councillor for Murfield, Martin Bolt. Welcome to you all. Good to have you all here. Thank you. Now, on to our first issue for this week. In light of the recent and extensive flooding in Somerset, a bid for some of the flood cash allocated by the government uh, for the disaster has been made by Murfield Councillor Martin Bolt. He said that a package of measures, including the dredging of Murfield's waterways, will help protect vulnerable parts of the town. He also said, if it's good enough for Somerset, then it's good enough for other areas. Well, we're very lucky to have you here this morning, Martin. Um, please enlighten us on what you want to happen in this area. Uh, well, firstly, the, the quote, um, although I, it'd be nice to, if it was me, it was actually said by the Prime Minister at Prime Minister's question time, uh, when people were addressing the issue. And I, that's when I uh, raised again the issue of uh, flood alleviation and mitigation in Kirklees because it was the Prime Minister's own words that if it's good enough for Somerset, it's good enough for other areas. And I, I immediately thought, well, it's good enough for Murfield then. Mm. I'd previously been told that dredging was for navigation, not for flood alleviation. But obviously, uh, if the Prime Minister has changed the goalposts on that, then I asked again for a, an assessment to be done of Murfield and Kirklees waterways to see whether, um, whether the dredging would improve things. We have a, an area in Murfield which for uh, probably 60 or 70 years has flooded badly uh, to the extent that there are archive photos of the landlady um, of the, the ship in being brought out of an upstairs window onto the back of a lorry in about the 1950s. So flooding is nothing new but we, uh, that's not to say that we shouldn't address it. So we need to look at this but also I think what we need to look at is if you mitigate one area what impact is it going to have down river on the others? Because I wouldn't want to be passing the problems further down the river. I think we need a, a solution, not a temporary uh, temporary measure. Okay. Montaz, uh, we're going to come on to another issue regarding the flooding in a little while, um, if we steer away from that for now. Um, in, with regards to the measures of dredging and, and the alleviation of and the prevention of future flooding in our area, um, what help can this, this bring to the wider Kirklees area? Because we're not just, uh, we don't just have the River Calder here, we've got mm -hmm. the River Colne, various others, uh, so what can it do to help us? I think it's going to be really, really important to start, to start taking measures such as dredging and other measures that I think nationally that the government sort of recognise that need to be taken in place in order to stop uh, from this happening. I, I think it's, it's sad to see when, when, when flooding takes place. I think people lose their, lose their precious items, their homes, they've grown up in, uh, and, and some of the items be so precious that they're not replaceable and they get lost. So I think it's really, really important in the future to, 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 to try and bring in these measures, especially I think with now the climate changes taking place, when we're having warm weather, we're having extreme warm weather, we're having rainy weather, it's going to be extremely rainy. So I think these measures are going to be very important to, to put into practice. Okay. Chris, do you think uh, the measures we had in place before the flooding were good enough, and are these measures that are coming in now that are being talked about going to be good enough to serve us in the future? The Kirk, the, the area of Kirk Lees is very diverse. We have both steep river valleys and floodplains, as at Dewsbury and Murfield. And th there is no one fix for the area. So where you want to slow down water in one place mm. and hurry it up at another yes. means that the mitigation of flooding is very complicated because rainfall is uneven, the drainage is uneven, and so it has to have a holistic view for, for the area, for the watercourse, rather than just any parochial interest. And that's, your question is, is pertinent because we don't know whether what we have is adequate or not. And I think we need to look at risk assessment for the whole of the area. And just to throw open to all of you, um, obviously very tragic what's happened uh, down, on the, um, down on the Thames. Um, 
do you think that certain measures that were in place before that had some kind of impact on flooding the Thames further upstream as opposed to further downstream? Um, I, don't, no. I certainly don't know enough about the Thames waterways uh, to say that, but as Chris says, we have a diverse community and one solution is not going to fit all. Um, I remember uh, the Spen Valley flooding a few years ago where one of the problems there was uh, floodgates were in place and the person who held the key to them lived at the other side of Doncaster. <laughs> Residents then took matters into their own hand and broke the locks off and opened the, the floodgates. Yeah. So the issues on what's uh, officially known as the River Spen, but everybody calls it Spen Beck, mm. may be different to the issues that are needed on the home and the cone. Uh, and I think you know, we need to, uh, to look at that, but then bring it together to a strategic view. Because as we said, if we un unblock things up at the home and the cone and the Spen, then they're going to feed downstream, and uh, Dewsbury would be the place that would uh, gather all those before it leaves Kirkley. So look at all the, the measures. We've now got a senior Kirkley's officer saying that we need uh, funding and, and measures, and I think it's good. Uh, we've been saying this for a while. It's good that it's been now recognised. As you know, in, in Murfield, the building houses on floodplains yes. uh, with the impact that people can't get into the houses because the access is underwater um, when it floods. It's at the side of the river cold and there's nowhere for the water to go. Mm. That's a big worry when you have to look at getting emergency services in. Mm. So I think you know, we need to look at that. We need to look at the planning regulations, not only the water courses, but how the uh, sewers and culverts are going to cope. Mm. Well, it's been briefly, briefly mentioned, I think, by yourself, Chris, about how we make uh, water ebb and flow in different areas. And of course, one of the tactics used by developers, dare we start talking about them today, um, is to create depressions in the land, mm. which may uh, reduce the impact of, of, of surface water on the development itself, but then have a risk of greater runoff to, to residents living further below that development. So, um, yeah, various issues, um, tough ones to answer, but... Um, the government is acting, and let's hope that the actions and the possible funding is good enough for the Kirklees area and alleviates future flooding. We're going to take a short break now. If you have any views regarding what's been discussed so far, you can contact us by email on info at kirkleeslocaltv.com and you can find us on Twitter by searching at Kirklees Local TV. See you after the break. Welcome back. My name is Thomas Hurst and you're watching Kirkley's Local TV's Weekly Wind-Up. Now on to our next issue. The Brunswick Building, formerly known as the Central Lads Brunswick Club, is to be demolished. If plans are approved, there will be a replacement building, the intended usage of which is currently unknown. The aspect of the planning application that has frustrated some is that the history, build history of the building has been omitted from it. Chris Marsden, Chair of the Huddersfield Civic Society, has said, it is so dismissive of the building, that's what concerns me. It's as if history is being wiped away. Now, again, conveniently, we have you here to discuss this today, Chris. Uh, what are your concerns uh, about this demolition? The pl planning system means, under the National Planning Policy Framework, that heritage buildings need to be assessed for their significance. And the Brunswick building um, was dismissed in the planning application for the proposed building, the unknown building. It was described as being associated with the Central Lads Club. It's much more than that. It was built in 1908 by Willie Cooper, the Huddersfield architect, um, who was a fellow of, the Royal Academy, fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects and was a senior officer of the Territorial Army. And he died in 1920, just when the Brunswick Club, sorry, the Central Lads Club was being established. But it was built as the police court mission home for probationers and men out of work in Huddersfield. And this was the start of the modern probation service. So that rather grand building had a very humble start um, in being um, to give offenders a step up in life from the court, to stop them being sent to jail. And all that information was lost in the application. Um, the um, Brunswick name came from the Brunswick Trust which was um, a prisoner of war organisation in Offlag 79 in northern Germany in 1944, 
where officers just decided that met young men after the war needed to be supported in social skills and youth work. And so the Central Lads Club became the Brunswick Club because local cricketer, the England cricketer Bill Bowes of the Brunswick Trust um, established the funding for the Brunswick Club. And none of that appeared in the application. And we believe that planning applicant, applicants need to take responsibility to our history and our heritage and our yes. architecture. Mm. So uh, if someone was to take the building, would it be better if they changed the usage but didn't demolish it and, and kept it in good use as it is? The bill, any building should be assessed for reuse before demolition. It makes economic and environmental sense to use the energy and materials again on site. Yeah. Um, none of that's been assessed here, and we're very keen for a wider debate on the, on the building. Okay. Well, I mean, the sports centre next to it can't really be said to hold any architectural merit, but I've, I've seen and walked past that building several times, and it really is a, a beautiful historic building uh, in keeping with other buildings on the campus which have been there for many, many years. So I, I'm sure it would be a sad, sad day to see it go. Um, Martin, what's your take on this situation? Is the history being properly considered? I think this is a, an issue which resonates, again, throughout the borough, that many buildings... Uh, may have unknown historical uh, significance, you know, lost in the mists of time. But first I think we should recognise this is on the uh, university campus and the university uh, has expanded massively and the benefits that it is bringing to, uh, to Kirk Lees in terms of employment and worldwide recognition as well as the educational. They are very much uh, a social conscience. I was pleased to be at a conference recently where the university are pushing for not only a minimum wage from contractors, but a living wage from all their contractors on site. So they have a very strong social conscience. The difficulty, I suppose, is for them absorbing the Brunswick building into their plans for that area. As you say, can it be converted without destroying either internally or externally any of the things uh, to give a 21st century uh, facility? I haven't seen the plans, so I don't know what, you know, so what the unknowns that are going there, but uh, I think we re need to recognise that the university don't take decisions lightly. Martin, there are no plans. Right. They've only applied a demolition of it without saying what, what would replace it. Sure, sure. And we think that's irresponsible. Yeah. For a heritage building to be demolished without any specific, mm. specific re replacement. Yeah. It, in fact, the, um, it was the college that bought the building in 1964 when it was part of... Um, the corporation, the technical college, bought the building, and that became the, became the Polytechnic, which in turn became the university. Yep. So universities had the building for, effectively for 50 years now, um, and it's been used recently as the International Study Centre, and it's, it's been put to, put to good use. Um, the, we, we, when, no one is in, was in favour of the old sports hall, but as someone pointed out last week to me, it has the advantage of hiding the view of the new sports hall. So, um, <laughs> um, which was perhaps no better. Yeah. So, I'm very keen that the Brunswick building be assessed properly in the documentation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the Civil Society last night gave an award for best in development in Huddersfield to Huddersfield University for the 3M Buckley building. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 we're very pleased to do that. A deserved award, but that doesn't mean that um, the national policy planning national planning policy framework can be dismissed or abused. It's important that we all keep the planning system. Yeah, I and mean, it seems to be a valid claim, especially in light of the fact that there are other old buildings on campus that do provide a 21st century facility. For example, the TA building, the Ramsden building. Uh, well, the TA building is not on the, it's within the footprint, but it's yes, totally it is, separate yeah. to the university yeah. campus, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And the Ramsden as well. Uh, yeah. You do walk up the staircases at times thinking you're at Hogwarts and the, the staircases are going to shift. But <laughs> and nevertheless, it provides a 21st century facility. So, of course, the key question is, can this be provided uh, in the Brunswick building as well for whatever the future intended usage is? Um, Mumtaz, heritage buildings, uh, are they something that should be preserved in our area for the beauty uh, in general of the borough? I think they, I think they should be preserved. Um, but then again, I think at the moment they, they, you do need to consider the regeneration, uh, the, the benefits of, of regenerating the area as well. Yeah. I think we are trying to move ahead now. Uh, university is trying to become a bit more of a real 21st century uh, a building, uh, an institute there. So I think they, they need to be reassessed the regeneration benefits 
against, I think, the preservation of uh, historical buildings. Mm -hmm. But the idea of regeneration would suggest that you bring back to life something which is dead and derelict, and this certainly doesn't seem to be the case with the Brunswick building, so um, why should that really happen with that building, do you think, if at all? I think it's the location of the building. It's, it's, it's on such a main, main road of the of Huddersfield, uh, and I think it has got great history, uh, as, 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 as you said by Chris earlier. I think a lot of the prisoners used to be kept in the basements of town hall, I think. Yep. And from town hall, the basement prisoners were taken out and sent to this building where they were given skills in trades. Um, mm -hmm. So it's had, a, it's had an element of uh, learning element inside that from, 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 from long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the location of the building is quite, a, quite important, really. Okay. Mm -hmm. The building has always had this history of promoting young people's welfare. In both as a reformatory preparation and for um, a youth club, both before and after the Second World War, and then later as part of the Technical College. Um, so you alluded to the um, drill hall. Uh, um, Willie Cooper was the architect for the drill hall as well. He was a lieutenant colonel in the TA, and he also designed the Kirkgate Inn, Osmond Kirkgate. So if anyone wants to look at Willie Cooper architecture, it is, it is there in Huddersfield. I think we've got to recognise the, the difficulties that civic society will have in this. Uh, in Murfield, we had a similar historic building, the Black Bull uh, Hotel in Murfield Town Centre, um, coaching it, something that's been established for many years. And we were, in Murfield, we argued about the historical significance, and yet uh, the Kirklees Planning Authorities appeared powerless to stop Tesco putting signs and everything and turning it into a convenience store. Um, I think the only way that uh, it could be retained and stopped is probably to get it uh, either spot listed or listed, isn't it? Because yeah. without that security, it's very difficult for the planning committee to go against national planning. Yeah. yeah. As you say, it's and it's difficult. It's difficult knocking something down when there isn't plans for the replacements. It's how can you eval evaluate what's going to be taken in its place on merit? Absolutely. Yeah. We have argued in our submission yeah. that the application should be refused, not on grounds of any proposal but simply because the application is deficient um, and you have to assess the significance of a building which hasn't been yeah. done. Yeah, quite right. Well, it may be just one building, but it is an issue that resonates with residents throughout the borough. Uh, we're going to take a quick break now, and if you wish to have uh, any comments on what's been discussed here so far, you can do so by contacting us on email uh, on info at kirkleyslocaltv.com and you can find us on Twitter by searching at kirkleyslocaltv. See you after the break. Welcome back. My name is Thomas Hurst, and you're watching Kirkley's Local TV's Weekly Wind-Up. Now, our next issue. Uh, Muslims from the Ahmadiyya Youth Association in Huddersfield have lent a helping hand to flood victims in the south of England. They spent hours wading through the mud and water, along with local community groups in Worcester, laying sandbags and surveying the worst hit areas. Uh, Mumtaz, I'll come straight to you on this. Um, this is surely uh, an asset to uh, Kirkley's that the Muslim community will go out uh, of their way, take time off work, go so far away to lend a helping hand. Uh, to what extent is this a good witness and uh, a good show of charity? I think it's very, very important what, uh, what they've done, uh, really, because I think as, as, a, as a Muslim community, um, as all communities, every communities, uh, BNB communities that reside um, in Kirklees, in England, uh, nationally, I think it's very, very important that we need to be playing our, our part and our role within any, any, any situation that occurs. We're here as British citizens, we're here to live and stay, we're part of the society, and we need to show that we are also part of the society. Yeah. And, and, and it's very important in terms of showing that we're part of society, not only to be doing well in terms of businesses and, and other developments, uh, but also helping uh, and giving that lending hand, I think, when somebody's in need as well. So, so this is very, very important. How exactly will this help further a positive image of the Muslim community in the Kirklees area? Yeah. I think it's very, very important um, to have a positive image. Sometimes there's a lot of negative media images that travel on, uh, on, 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 on media, on newspapers, on television, uh, and, and this will be a positive story that can, that can be taken forward and seen a positive contribution being made. 
Uh, and I'd like to say, I think it's not just the, uh, just the Muslim community, there are other communities who have also yeah. been involved equally uh, and played a very active role. Chris, what are your views on uh, the Muslim community uh, reaching out and playing an active role in the recovery process in the South? Well, it's admirable. It's great that communities feel they are part of other communities in the, in the country. Um, I would hate to think that we feel that we, we're in isolation from anyone else and that we need to support people across the nation and, um, and in overseas aid. And so my, I take my hat off. Okay. It's first class. Okay. Martin, what do you think on this? I think it's um, a great asset to Kirklees, uh, not just the Muslim community, but the whole of the Kirklees community, that uh, when somebody is going down to help someone. And it's an example I think we should all uh, take on board, that you not just to help people when it directly affects you, but to help your neighbours is in the, the biblical sense. Um, so they're helping people when it's not directly of impact or that. It's something that we should applaud. Um, I don't know if they have any connection. I don't think they have any connection with, with Somerset from the local Amadaya. Um, but you know, it's great that they're helping people in time of need. Um, I've recently been contacted by the Amadaya Association on something completely different. And they're doing um, something close to my heart. They're doing a charity cycle event. Uh, they're going from Glasgow to London in June. And they were passing through Huddersfield. So again, they'll be raising awareness and raising money for charity. And not... Uh, the charity in this case is one of them is the British Heart Foundation. So they are, they are very outwardly facing, and I think you know, we should congratulate and thank them for their humanitarian aims. Okay. Well, they're going to have nice tarmac roads in our area. Not ready for them, incidentally, but for the Tour de France. So <laughs> uh, it, will be, it will be a smooth ride for once through this area for them. Um, now, on next issue, Kirklees has been urged not to sell off pieces of artwork that it took into its possession upon its creation as a council borough in 1974. The council has only 15% of its 30,000 pieces of art on display. The collection contains several valuable pieces, such as the Francis Bacon Figure Study 2, valued at £19 million, the Henry Moore sculpture, Falling Warrior, valued currently at £1.5 million, and an oil painting by John Martin, worth £2 million. Um, Martin, I'll kick off with you on this one. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that you've had a view on this um, as, you know, in, in your, um, your political capacity. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Should the art go or should it stay as a, a focal point? I can understand residents' concerns that you can only sell things off once. Um, and some of these, you, know, you would ask how many residents have actually seen them. I know that we had a Henry Moore from one of the London boroughs up at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park and I think they'd almost forgotten that they had it. Um, so there's the issue about how accessible are they to people? You know, how many people in North Kirklees have seen these? I think the wider thing is here is not just the artworks, but the assets which Kirklees have come by over many years. Um, going back to 1973 when they took assets from the, the smaller councils, all of those come, now coming into the mix. And again, I'm seeing in Murfield uh, land that Kirklees took over being sold off. And I view that the same way as the artworks, that these were things that were given to Kirklees in safekeeping, in one case by uh, a a local family, they gave a building for the use of the people and that's now under threat and I think you know, we should view all our assets in the same way that should they be sold off or should they be retained for the public good. Chris, what do you think about the artwork? You, you have a seemingly a historically keen eye. Um, should this go or should it stay? The premise is wrong. There are thir not 30,000 but less than 3,000 artworks in the Kirtley's collection and that actually is number of paintings, I think, is, is less than 2,000. It's like 1,700 paintings. And 20% of those, or 21% of those, are on display at any time. And anyone can go in and view the Henry Moore, the Lowry's, and the John Martin for free. It's uh, the... Um, Francis Bacon is currently on somewhere else in the world on, on loan. And when it gets back, it will be on display in the art gallery. This collection has been assembled over many years to carefully reflect our times and our culture. If the work is sold, then we risk losing funding, um, cultural funding, as part of the allocation from the Arts Council and government 
we lose the rights to to um, to expect people to to donate paintings. Benefactors won't donate paintings right. to, to to the collection because they will see them being sold off for short for short term measures. Art is an important part of our well-being and our healthy and diverse community. We can share each other's artwork from around the world here in the art gallery. I can't think of any premise in which we should start selling artwork um, because we will lose the numbers, we will lose reputation, we will lose funding. Okay. Well, very interesting stuff being discussed there. Uh, now on to our last issue for this week. Illegal and potentially cancer-causing dyes have been found in traditional sweets widely consumed in the Asian community. Um, now, this appears to be a dichotomy between uh, government interference versus non-government interference. Uh, as always on things that may cause us harm, such as alcohol or, or cigarettes, uh, it's always a case of does the government try to regulate other people's morality and habits, or does it step out and let people decide this for themselves? Um, Mumtaz, have you consumed these sweets yourself? Uh, and if so, is this something that the Asian community should just decide for themselves? Um. I have certainly consumed them, and I'd hate to see them being taken off shelves uh, within the community. But, but saying that, I think putting my sweet tooth aside, um, I think it's very, very important that the safety measures are, are, are considered first and utmost, um, especially young people, older people, or everybody within the community eats the, these sweets. Uh, and if they're causing such, such harm and some, such damage, I think it's very, very important. Um, that they should be looked into to find out what the, uh, what the causes are. Um, I think the shopkeepers, the suppliers, uh, the businesses who are selling these, these sweets, I think they need to be contacting their suppliers to find out um, the ingredients they're using, are those ingredients safe, making sure they're certified that those ingredients are safe and have been checked by a relevant body. Um, so I think these measures really do need to be taken place. Uh, and, and I think the first people to take action would be the businesses themselves, to contact yeah. their suppliers mm. and, and, and question, um, question the products. Mm. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying, uh, well, uh, there are some issues that, that should be addressed here in terms of the ingredients, suppliers should be contacted and so on. Mm. However, up until this point, you've consumed these sweets with those illegal dyes in. So isn't there, a, isn't there a part of you that says, well, I've done it so far, why should you stop me from continuing to do it? Well, that's what the community would see. I think that's how the community would feel, and they'll think that we've, had, we've been eating this for so, so many years. Um, uh, but, but, but I think equally along with that, I think the point needs to be put forward to the community. I think it's the, it's the dangers, um, the future dangers that I can bring up about as well. Uh, and some of the health implications that maybe it's had within the community, as you, and as we're aware within the Asian community in particular, diabetes, strokes, heart conditions, uh, these are sort of uh, the illnesses that are, that are on the prime, on the rise. Um, and who knows, maybe there the, the may be a, some kind of a contribution maybe from these sweets as well. Yeah. So I think uh, certainly this action should be taken, I think. I mean, this is not the only issue of late. I mean, we've been talking about actually quite a national issue about the banning of the recreational drug KET. Uh, which has upset certain uh, aspects of the Muslim community, in particular uh, Somalis and Yemenis who traditionally uh, do take that for a, a recreational high. Uh, ultimately, should these sweets con continue to be sold uh, in one form or another in the same traditional way that they've been enjoyed over the past few, however many decades or even longer? I can't see why they, sh they can't be continue to be sold. Uh, I think the issue here is that the businesses need to be contacting their suppliers. The suppliers need to be taking the relevant steps to make sure this product is safe to be sold on, on shelves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chris, what do you think should be done about this product, if, if anything? Well, this is a, a clear case for trading standards and a public analyst. Um, carcinogens and other obnoxious substances keep coming up into our food supply. Um, they are banned by um, national and European legislation, there's no excuse for them to be in the food chain. Um, it's coming in cultivation of spices and herbs and bread and our meat. Uh, this is no different. And the sweets should be kept. Just remove the adulterants. Um, and the, we, that's why we fund the um, pay taxes for public health. 
So uh, does that mean we keep them but with changed ingredients or do they go all together? Oh, uh, no, it's just because it's just the banned substances should be removed from the sweets and replaced by um, harmless alternatives. Okay. Martin, do you concur with that? Very much, yes. The key point, I think you said in your introduction, is that they contain illegal dyes. And, and as Chris has said, all, all food products should have a list of ingredients in them. If they're not uh, being displayed with those ingredients so that people can see what's in them, then they shouldn't be on sale. And I, don't, I think it's not just an issue for the, uh, the Asian community, as has been inferred, but because Kirklees is such a diverse and multicultural society, children from the Asian community where these are on sale, maybe taking sweets to school and offering them to people from different communities as children do and sharing them. So it's, we shouldn't see this as a uh, thing affecting one community. It is for the whole community to take a look at. And as Chris has said, we have legislation already in place supposed to be protectors because uh, yeah, we, we may all have things which we, we wonder why they are banned, but they're banned by until they're proven safe for a very good reason. And because the problems of this may come in years to come, mm -hmm. the carcinogens and things may find their way out. I think yeah, we need to ensure that things on public display and sale are safe for all to use. Okay. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for this week. As always, please remember to send us your comments, hints and tips. We'd love to hear what you think. Uh, in order to do this, you can contact us on email uh, on info at kirkleyslocaltv.com and you can find us on Twitter by searching at Kirkley's Local TV. A big thank you to all our guests today. Thank you for being on. Pleasure to hear your views as usual. Um, I'm Thomas Hurst, and you've been watching Kirkley's Local TV's Weekly Wind-Up. We look forward to you tuning in again next week. Goodbye. <laughs>